Okay, many thanks and thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Daniel Sudarsky from the Universidad Nacional de México. It's a collaboration with many authors, so I know I don't want to say anything. But okay, so the, the title is addressing the cold quantum classical divide in cosmology, platform physics, etc., and the entropic era of time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the invitation, for organizing this very interesting event and and Thank you, Olympia. I don't know where she is, but um, and I'm sorry for the delay. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a subject that is connected with many issues that we have uh, uh, studied uh, for many years with several uh, collaborators. The main, the main topic uh, uh, or, or or the subject uh, of this workshop will be touched uh, at the at the very end uh, so most of the thing is going to most of the talk is going to uh, focus on motivation for that for the idea that I will discuss at the end and uh, well as I said many of many of the, these ideas have been worked with uh, 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 several collaborators and students and so forth and the main the main issue uh, uh, is uh, work with uh, Elias that is sitting over there, so he's partly responsible for for this. <laughs> um, okay, so what's the plan of the talk? Uh, the quantum measurement problem in the gravitational context and how we how we deal with the with the quantum gra the gravity quantum interface, which does not in our in our case does not mean that we will consider or propose a particular theory of quantum uh, gravity. I will show you what what is the, the issue, and then uh, we will explore with this with this approach a couple of of uh, situations in which both gravity and quantum theory come together. One of them is uh, the inflationary account for the emergence of the seeds of cosmic structure uh, that we do see in the in the CMB, and we are studying with uh, a lot of interest and the black hole information puzzle, two subjects which are uh, difficult to, to handle. Uh, and then, after certain considerations that will emerge from, from studying these two particular uh, problems, uh, I will come to how this uh, uh, can relate to the arrow uh, of time. Okay, the first thing is, uh, it's very hard to think about physics without space-time framework. We saw evidence of that in the discussion we had just previously had before, before uh, we broke. Uh, and if one wants to, at the same time, adopt a clear view about quantum theory, things become even harder, and I think that that is well, well understood by everybody. Um, Failure to face those issues often uh, drives people to confusion, and one of the examples of confusion that is very, you know, very frequent is the uh, notion of fluctuations. <laughs> so people use the same words for things that are sometimes, you know, quantum uncertainties, sometimes stochastic fluctuations, uh, also mixing up ensembles or single extended systems. Uh, the failure to distinguish between these various notions of uh, fluctuations uh, uh, is often accompan accompanied by failure to distinguish between proper and improper mixtures in quantum theory, and this, of course, is uh, can be traced to a problem, a propensity among physicists to ignore the elephant in the room. And this is the elephant in the room. The M problem, I call it, is the measurement problem in quantum theory. And then we are going to start by facing that uh, problem. Uh, the problem, <coughs> or part of the problem, is uh, the fact that we have these two rules for determining the evolution of a quantum system, the unitary evolution and the reduction uh, postulate. And it's not clear, there is no satisfactory rule, general rule, specifying which one applies in each circumstance. Some guidance regarding the, the options that seem possible uh, uh, to, 
to address this can be gained by uh, uh, considering the, the, the work, this work by, by Tim Motlin, uh, in which he basically shows that the, uh, these three postulates cannot be held uh, in a self-consistent manner. Uh, the characterization of the wave function by, by uh, of a system by its wave function is complete. The negation of that takes us to hidden variable theories. The evolution of the wave function always follows the Schrodinger equation. Its negation takes us to things like spontaneous collapse theories. And uh, third, the result of the experiments lead to definite results. Its negation takes us, for instance, to many world, many minds, or consistent histories approach. And hopefully, in this audience, it's a, this comment is not required. The M problem is not solved by decoherence. <coughs> if you hold, held that view, we will have to have a discussion, but it will have to wait until I'm done. Uh, OK, so <coughs> at the same time, as I, as I mentioned, we want to explore this interface between uh, gravity and the quantum theory. And we will follow a, what I like to call a top-bottom approach, which contrasts with the usual approach to the subject, which is, we call it the bottom-up approach, which starts by postulating, assuming that you have in your hands the fundamental, a fundamental theory of quantum gravity, something like string theory, loop quantum gravity, or other candidate uh, uh, theories that have been considered, and then one works in that uh, field by trying to connect from that fundamental theory that, that you postulate, you try to connect to regimes of interest in the world out, dea, uh, out there, like you know, black holes, cosmology, and, and so forth. The, top, uh, 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 the other approach, the one that we uh, follow, is to take existing relatively well-tested and well-developed theories uh, and apply it uh, and push them to regimes where we know they will start to show some, you know, some, some, some friction uh, among them. Uh, we will also consider adding modifications that can serve as clues about the nature of a more fundamental theory. So hopefully these two approaches are complementary. Uh, in concrete, the idea is to push GR, our best theory of, of gravitation, together with quantum field theory uh, for description of matter, and that means using a semi-classical approach to gravity. That is, I will not postulate a quantum theory of gravity, although per probably there must be some theory of that sort, but we know that at s in some realms it should, you know, reduce to uh, general relativity, and, uh, uh, and of course, matter will be this is described by quantum field theory. Uh, and we will do this while taking a definite approach towards the measurement problem. And <coughs> we will stick to, uh, to, uh, um, to a view uh, in which we take a, an ontological uh, uh, posture that is provisional. It's provisional in the sense that I'm trying to be clear about what my theory says, even though I accept that this theory is not at this point the fundamental uh, theory. And uh, as I said, we will work with, uh, with semi-classical gravity, which uh, we think or trust that it would be uh, a good approximation as long as curvatures are not too large and uncertainties are not uh, too large. And therefore, <coughs> Given this, this uh, approach to the quantum, gravi quantum and gravity in interface, it's very natural to think that the local viables of the theory are what really restricts the space-time curvature, that is the left-hand side of the Einstein uh, equation, which in this case would be the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor. A, a difficulty uh, that this approach has to deal with is a uh, a problem we identified in a recent paper with Tim and, and Elias here, uh, showing that all the possible uh, uh, approaches to the measurement problem seem to lead to the conclusion that the 
energy momentum tensor or its, its expectation value or whatever will replace you replace the energy momentum tensor in that treatment will fail to uh, satisfy divergence of energy momentum equal to zero. Yes. Even Everett? Sorry? This happens to Everett as well? This happens to Everett for, as well if you consider each particular branch. If you consider the superposition of all branches, you don't. But if you focus on one particular, any one particular branch, this will fail. Yes. And, and in BOM, it's happening because the energy momentum tensor is linked to the particle? Yeah, you, you, well, there is no clear, uh, uh, there is no agreed universal definition of what to do, right, right. but all, at all possible, you know, ra reasonable approaches to build something like that fail to satisfy. I, I, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. I mean, I don't, it, it clearly, if you attach, uh, if you calculated the tensor from just from the wave. Ah, uh, no, no. The, but that we don't consider that uh, as appropriate because the, the uh, particles play a very relevant okay. role okay. in the ontology. Okay. So as, I'm sa as I said, here I want this energy momentum tensor to be a central part of the ontology. Okay, <coughs> okay. so let me go quickly because I don't have t uh, too much time. Regarding the measurement problem, we will concentrate on spontaneous collapse uh, theories. There's lots of work on the subject, you probably know about it, the GRW uh, approach, then the developments by uh, Philip Pearl, CSL, uh, work by Diossi and Penrose, etc., and some propose recent proposals that make the, our attempt to make the theory compatible with relativity. The basic idea is to unify in a single dynamical equation, uh, role of evolution, the uh, U and R uh, rules of, of, of uh, evolution that I mentioned before. And this is done by modifying the uh, Schrodinger equation, including spontaneous reductions uh, with a certain rate, uh, driving the states to eigenstates in the, in the, uh, of, of a certain operator that in the non-relativistic case is taken to be the smear position operator over a certain scale. These changes are extremely small when you have a few degrees of freedom. It becomes uh, uh, very important when you have a very large number of degrees of freedom and they happen to be entangled because the reduction of one of those degrees of freedom will at that point produce the reduction in all of the degrees of freedom and then the rate will be very, very large. Anyway, the, this, uh, this parameter lambda should be small enough not to conflict with test of quantum mechanics in, 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 in the regimes it has been tested and should uh, be large enough to produce, you know, Rapid, relatively rapid localization of macroscopic objects. So there is a, re, a, a, a natural type of values for the for the this parameter, this uh, reduction rate, and the localization uh, scale. How do I have a pointer? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. So the theory is being experimentally tested. This is, I think, a very nice thing. We want we want theories that are we can subject to to experimental exploration. Uh, let me now tell you about a, a version, a particular version called continuous spontaneous localization, which is basically the continuous. Uh, version uh, of the theory just described uh, described previously. In this case, the theory, uh, the solution of the of the uh, evolution equation, which is easier to write than the than the actual equation, uh, it is uh, governed by well, one piece is the standard Hamiltonian, which would be dominant in most situations, and then uh, this other piece is the modification introduced by the theory which is uh, uh, characterized by this parameter lambda that I, that I mentioned before, or closely related to that, a stochastic function of time and a particular operator, which is the operator that we call it the collapse operator, is what the theory is supposed to drive the, a, any system uh, to eigenstates or to close to eigenstates to, of that uh, operator. And probabilities are computed in this theory by giving a, a probability rule for the uh, 
uh, realization of a particular, a particular uh, for each particular uh, uh, stochastic, uh, uh, well, 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 each particular realization of a of a stochastic uh, of the stochastic variable. Uh, well, which is given by this expression. Let me not get too much into the details. Uh, as we said, for a single particle in not relativistic quantum mechanics, this uh, op op uh, operator is the position operator. Um, it's often believed that this parameter should not be the same for all particles, but probably depends on the mass of the particle species. And then <coughs> the actual operator that is often used is something called the smear mass density operator. That's that in non relativistic many particles, uh, quantum mechanics will be given by this uh, expression. And this suggests very strongly that we build the collapse operator in a relativistic setting out of the energy momentum tensor. And the same way that here <coughs> uh, this operator will be the cause of collapse, somehow perhaps this operator will be the cause of collapse. But as I said, the ontology will be centered on this object be simply because this is the object that appears on the left hand side of Einstein's equations in the semi classical uh, setting. Uh, of course, we have a very serious problem, as I said, because this object is not conserved during the collapse process. So we will need to deal with, with that problem. Uh, we have developed some, uh, some uh, scheme to deal with that. The scheme is based on what we call the semi-classical self-consistent configuration uh, uh, formalism. That is basically a self-consistent uh, choice of a space-time metric, quantum field theory constructed on that space-time metric, and a particular state of that construction such that Einstein semi-classical equations hold for that equation. That object is uh, uh, self-referral, so it needs to be out, you know, needs to be constructed in a, in a, in a way that ensures the self-consistency. Uh, and when the idea is that when you have a jump in the, uh, in the uh, state of, the, of your fields due to this spontaneous collapse, then the whole thing will jump, not only the state of the quantum field, but the state of the quantum field and the rest of the construction will have to jump too to a new space-time, a new quantum field theory on this new uh, space-time. So, so we will elevate these collapses as occurring in, the, in, in connecting two of these uh, self-consistent configurations. Okay. Applications. How am I doing in time? Okay, first of all, you know, in inflations and the seeds of cosmic structure, as you all know, contemporary cosmology has as inflation as one of its uh, important components. And its most uh, uh, remarkable success is its claim ability to account for the emergence of the seeds of structure in the world, in the universe as a result of quantum fluctuations with the correct uh, spectrum that we, in fact, observe in the CMB and also in traces of the, the structure of the distribution of galaxies that we can uh, observe. However, this account has a, a very serious conceptual theoretical problem, uh, which makes the account re really not satisfactory. Uh, I'm going to focus now on what is this, this problem. Uh, the standard account in that, that you'll find in, in, in books or, or in talks will start from, you know, considering the, uh, the metric describing cosmology uh, as a Friedman Robertson Walker uh, space time and adding perturbations of the metric that are characterized by this object called the Newtonian potential and, for instance, this object that uh, is the, represents the tensor uh, modes. This is in some specific gauge. Uh, ma with matter represented by the inflaton field, normally again considered by as a background field and a perturbation. And then people quantize all the perturbations uh, containing the spatial dependences. All the other parts that are not subject to quantum treatment are uh, independent of spatial coordinates. So they represent a homogeneous anisotropic situation. Uh, 
Therefore, the full, back, the full background is, is uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic, and uh, you can find what is the dynamics in terms of, of, of uh, conformal uh, of co conformal time, the scale factor behaves in this particular way. Uh, <coughs> we set, we fix this, the scale by saying this is one in the current, uh, the current time, and the cosmological regime occurs in this epoch. As I said, these perturbations are treated quantum mechanically, and it's assumed that uh, because inflation tends to produce this very dramatic and accelerated expansion of the universes, all pre-existing features that were there in the very early stages of the universe would become so diluted that the states of all fields will be driven to the vacuum, a particular vacuum called the Bunch-Davis vacuum. So all these perturbations will be characterized by the vacuum uh, states. And now the story, the, the story uh, continues by telling you, well, the, in this vacuum we also have quantum fluctuations. Actually, what you have is quantum uncertainties, and here is one of the places where this mistake is made in confusing quantum fluctuations as if they were stochastic fluctuations. Um, after you do that, you know, unjustified assumption, you obtain a, a so-called prediction for the distribution of perturbations as a function of scale, and they give, produce the perturbations that actually fit with, with uh, observations. However, this story cannot be right because this, the background, as we said, was completely homogeneous and isotropic, and the, and the vacuum state that characterizes the perturbations is also completely homogeneous and isotropic. It's straightforward to apply, for instance, a displacement to the vacuum state, and this displacement acting on the vacuum produces the same state. The, that means, of course, there cannot be a feature here that is not uh, here if the description of your system is the complete wave function. Uh, of course, the situation we have, we find ourselves today, there are galaxies, stars, planets, and us, and that is not homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, then the question is how does this transition occur in if the dynamics of the closed system doesn't break such symmetries. Uh, so our approach to the problem, as I said, is to uh, treat this, the, the system semi-classical, using semi-classical equations, but adding this collapse of the wave uh, function. We will, let me concentrate for the moment on the, on the modes with the k values different from zero, so modes with a particular wavelength. And, uh, and apply a, 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 a practical procedure that we have checked coincides with our produces results that coincide with the with the uh, SSC formalism that I described brief, briefly before. The idea is that, that uh, again the early stages of inflation, the universe is the, the the state of the fields are characterized by by the vacuum. That vacuum has some uncertainties in the fields, and the collapse will change the state from the vacuum to some state that is not longer the vacuum and therefore will break the homogeneity and isotropy. The universe will correspond then to one particular realization of the collapse. If, you, if we describe the collapse using the CSL theory, it will correspond to one particular realization of these stochastic functions and therefore will not be, this will break the homogeneity and isotropy of the situation. Um, if we, we will, if we focus on the scalar perturbations, which are the ones that are we, we see in the CMB, uh, in the temperature fluctuations, in the temperature fluctuations in the CMB, and go to uh, you know the composition in Fourier, uh, pass to Fourier, uh, Fourier characterization of of the modes, one Einstein semi-classical equations reduces to this equation, where we see that the perturbation in the field. In the, in, the, in the metric perturbation is controlled by the expectation value in the new state of the uh, momentum conjugate to the field uh, to the momentum to the field in that uh, particular uh, mode. Okay, so when the system 
so, so when the system collapses to some state that is not the vacuum and has a value for this quantity that is different from zero, then you produce a Newtonian potential that is different from zero, breaking the homogeneity of the metric. Um, in, this, in this paper, we have shown that you can produce the correct spectrum if you choose your collapse operators properly. Not every choice of the collapse operators will produce things that, that work correctly. We have investigated collapses that are uh, controlled by the momentum conjugate to the field or by the field operator, and we find out that we need either to assume that the wave function, that the wave, that, that the um, collapse rate depends on the mode in this particular way, or to say that the operators that control the things are not the momentum or the field, but these objects acting on the momentum of the field. Why is this the right thing? We don't know. The, but this is what will produce for you the right spectrum. We hope that this may be obtained by trying to relate this to the energy momentum uh, tensor, perhaps the energy momentum tensor contracted with itself if one is looking for a scalar. Uh, anyway, we, we th the point is we, at this point, don't know what, what is the, the right collapse operator, but it's interesting that we need to assume that somehow the rate of collapse is not, is, is, is not a constant. If, if you do that, you produce a spectrum that is, has the correct behavior, the scale invariant spectrum, with a magnitude that is uh, for standard numbers uh, associated with the potential uh, Raninified scale, for instance, for, for the potential of the inflaton and the correct slow, uh, you know, uh, slow roll parameter, uh, you, and you match, you, you, ask your, you, you ask to match these two observations, you obtain a value for this parameter that is, interestingly enough, not very far from the original suggestion from the GRW. Uh, proposal. Uh, other people have uh, studied this, this question, for instance, Jerome Martin and uh, S. Das and, and, and company in various papers. Um, in a recent work, they argue that if they, they take a, a straightforward extrapolation to CSL theory using the collapse operator as simply the density perturbation, they obtain uh, results that are that are in conflict with observation, uh, but we should note that the extrapolation of a theory that is designed to work in the laboratory in many particle physics to a regime in the early universe and to a quantum field theory like the inflaton field is not very straightforward. Right? In one case we are collapsing things to a position operator, in that other case we are collapsing things to some something that is constructed out of the energy momentum tensor, and these two things are not obviously uh, uh, related. Uh, as I mentioned also, the collapse rate seems to depend on the, on, the, on the mass of the particle, and it's very interesting that if one makes a very simple modeling of a, of a mass, uh, for instance, like a sphere that is, uh, has a constant density and has the size of a of the Compton radius of the, of, of the particle and computes the space-time associated with that particle and, and takes something like the Weyl curvature integrated over space-time, uh, over the whole space-time, the result is proportional to mass to the power fifth. So if you, you could have a mass, a, a, a parameter that is proportional to the mass by taking the fifth square root of this quantity. Impo the important, the interesting thing is, the interesting point here is that something that becomes mass dependent may result from some dependence of the, of the system on curvature. Okay, so that's the first hint. The second hint will come from the black hole information puzzle. So this is the standard story about the black hole inf inf uh, uh, information puzzle. Uh, as you know, Hawking discovered that quantum effects lead to a black, to leads to uh, radiation by uh, black holes, and therefore one expects them to lose mass and essentially disappear, leaving just thermal radiation in its, uh, after it's gone, or perhaps a small remnant that will be relevant for our, our discussion. 
Normally, quantum theory requires a unitary relationship between the initial and final state if these states are associated with Cauchy hypersurfaces. People somehow extend this requirement, modify the demand by requiring a unitary relation between the states described in past null infinity and future null infinity. And this seems both unwarranted because the, in this picture, past future null infinity is not a Cauchy hypersurface and also very hard to account. The people have had a very hard time trying to account for, for that. Uh, Okay, people talk about a black hole information paradox. Why do they mention that there is a, a paradox if as, if, as I said, there was this, this relationship uh, was, unitary relationship was unwarranted. It's, there is a paradox only if one assumes that quantum gravity both cures the singularity and removes the need to have a, 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 a final boundary of space-time as I, as I had here. Okay, here you have the singularity, or it perhaps is cured, but also, but in a way that requires you to put a boundary here. In any of those situations, there would be no paradox whatsoever because your final hypersurface is not a Cauchy hypersurface. However, if quantum gravity cures the singularity and removes the need to put an additional boundary, then we have a, a picture like that, where the singularity is replaced by a quantum gravity region, and you have, you can have a uh, you, you can consider the state of your fields in, the in sigma 1, which is an initial hypersurface, and try to see how you account for what the, must be the state in sigma 2. In sigma 1, you could have a pure state. In sigma 2, apparently, all the energy is in this radiation that is emitted here. So it's very difficult to, uh, to explain how this state could be unitary related to this one. I'm going to use then uh, this other hypersurface sigma 3, which is an hypersurface that borders the, the quantum gravity region uh, uh, from below and then basically extends to uh, future null infinity uh, in a smooth way. <coughs> and then people say, well, there, is a, there, there would be a puzzle because we have an initial state that could be a pure state and a final state that is a thermal state. What, how did this happen and the first point you know if, if the evolution is supposed to be unitary but of course anybody that is you know devoted to quantum mechanics and sitting in the audience will tell you no well in quantum mechanics textbooks quantum mechanics breaks unitarity uh, in connection with measurements and this brings us back to the measurement problem as we said we are dealing with the measurement problem with a uh, uh, using spontaneous collapse theories in which you have departures from unitarity even if there is no measurement whatsoever. Therefore, uh, it's natural to consider a picture in which this breakdown of unitarity is the same breakdown of unitarity both in the black hole and in the measurement problem. This is, has been explored in these uh, papers. What we have studied in the tail model of that uh, based on, on <coughs> on this type of uh, two-dimensional black hole uh, model and more or less schematically in four dimensions because it's harder to do it in this I mean, this is in you can find the four-dimensional version in this uh, 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 recent paper anyway I think I'm not doing with so good with time anymore how much time do we have uh, roughly 12 minutes okay so very quickly we start let, let me start then in the previous past with a state which is, let's say, the vacuum state of a quantum field and uh, a matter pulse for another uh, 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 matter field that is going to collapse and produce a, a black hole. We'll separate these two fields just for convenience. Uh, we have this state, it evolves, the pulse will eventually collapse, produce a black hole. Uh, and one could describe the quantum fields at late times in terms of the degrees of freedom after the black hole has formed out, uh, in terms of the degrees of freedom inside and outside the black hole. If one does that, the vacuum looks as a superposition of multiple particle uh, states according to the notion, in particular the notion of 
uh, particle that is natural at late times and some appropriate notion of particle that we put for convenience inside uh, the black hole. Uh, the sum here is of, over uh, states that represent a arbitrary number of particles in different, different uh, individual excitations. Uh, if one traces over the degrees of freedom that are internal to the black hole, one would obtain the famous Hawking result, which is a thermal uh, radiation. But of course, that is tracing over the degrees of freedom, and that's not the complete state of the, of the situation. And moreover, when the black hole evaporates, we will not have anything to trace over, because there will be no internal part of the black hole. So we need to account for how our initial state that now having described the vacuum state of, of one of the quantum fields in, 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 this term, <coughs> in these terms and adding the pulse that is going to collapse has this form, evolves from this pure state to a density matrix, a thermal density matrix. How does one account for that? Uh, okay, we will use a spontaneous collapse theories and we will assume, uh, well, choose a particular foliation of of, of the space-time and we'll assume that the collapse rate uh, depends, we will assume that the collapse rate depends on curvature actually in, in such a way, on the vial curvature in such a way that it blows up uh, as, as the curvature blows up. <coughs> we apply CSL in a particular way, we uh, will assume that the collapse uh, occurs ma mainly inside the black hole where the parameter is large and the collapse occurs to a definite to a state of definite number of particles in the internal region um, and I will work in, a, in, a, in the interaction picture assuming that the fields are basically free so the Hamiltonian here will go to zero if I do that and if I assume that the collapse rate depends on the curvature uh, in an appropriate way I will manage to ensure that the, what normally happens in CSL theory, which is that the states are driven to the, towards eigenstates of the collapse operator in an infinite amount of time, here it will occur in a very short time. And we need a very short time because there is a very short amount of proper time towards the, singul towards the singularity. So we need this if we want to account for erasing the information inside the, the black hole. If one does that, then the effect of CSL will converse the, convert the initial, the initial state that I told you was described by this quantum superposition into one of these states. Okay, one of the states of the superposition because as I said it collapses to a state of definite number of particles inside. But we don't know which one because it will depend on the, the particular realization of the, of the functions W. If I now consider an ensemble Oh, oh, sorry, and bef before considering an ensemble, I, I now need to tell you what happens to this state. This state is a pure state, <coughs> but as I said, we don't know what happens. Now, inside the black hole, we will assume that quantum gravity, as I said, cures the singularity and that and replaces it by something relatively uh, uh, reasonable, but it has to be something that, since all the energy is outside in the radiation, the, the particles that went inside and the poles that went inside somehow must to combine into something that has almost no energy and the most natural assumption is that it's some kind of vacuum, post-singularity vacuum and that is what comes on the other side of the singularity. Once I do this assumption and consider now an ensemble of black holes prepared all in the same way, the evolution is going to take me to an ensemble of uh, states that is going to describe by, be described by a density matrix and just following the calculation that I just gave and doing the proper average you end up with a state that is this post-singularity vacuum times a thermal state in the region where the Hawking radiation is uh, uh, occurring and therefore <coughs> we have the evolution of a pure state to a mixed thermal state without any uh, paradox and, 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 and nothing strange. We understand what, how this uh, happened. Okay, so how this all connects with the arrow of time. 
Uh, let me first say that the, uh, David uh, here, uh, David Albert, has considered relationship between arrow of time, initial state of the universe, and, and, and things of that, uh, and collapse uh, theories from a different point of view. Yesterday we were discussing, and apparently our views are not, are, are, cannot be held simultaneously, but I'm not sure that, I'm, I'm not sure by, I'm not completely convinced by that. Anyway, the point is that uh, Roger Penrose has proposed that uh, the very special initial state of the universe that normally is thought to account for the arrow of time uh, is characterized by uh, a state that is, well, his observation is, look, at the late, at the late times the universe is populated by many large black holes and that contains a lot of vile curvature. The very early universe doesn't seem to contain anything like white holes that would have also very large uh, uh, curvature. So the early universe apparently has a very low value of vile curvature, despite the fact that it has a very high value of the scalar curvature. So that is, that is uh, uh, the way he wants to characterize, or he believes one should characterize this particular uh, feature of the universe, this is, this, is, this is the picture, this seems to be our universe, this, this, the, the, these features here are supposed to be representing black holes and high levels of vile curvature, and he says, well, a symmetric picture would be like this, this could be the generic Big Bang, but apparently our Big Bang is in this form, of this form, and this is, must be imposed as a law of an initial condition that is of course a very different type of law from all other laws that we are used to. We are used to laws that are <laughs> dynamical, and this is a law that fixes the initial conditions. So this takes us now to view, look at this evolution equation that I uh, wrote before. As I told you, uh, this parameter, th th this is the standard evolution, this is the orderly re evolution controlled by the Hamiltonian uh, mechanics, and this is the correction caused by CSL. <coughs> this term, this evolution is basically a stochastic controlled by the size, and is controlled by the size of lambda that under normal circumstances is not very large unless you have very many uh, degrees of freedom. <coughs> so, under generic uh, circumstances, the global evolution, the dominant part of the evolution of large systems is determined by the Hamiltonian part with collapse doing what it needs to do, uh, becoming relevant when few degrees of freedom play a very crucial role, like when you do an experiment. Uh, however, if lambda depends on the vile curvature, then in the regimes where, the, where vile curvature is very large, then the dominant part of the evolution, the do these terms will dominate the evolution and then the evolution would be completely stochastic, completely random. What does that lead us to? It leads us to a picture in which the universe could have, started, could have been forever in a state of high vile curvature and evolving randomly for eons and eons until by chance it will hit a state of low vile curvature and it's only then that orderly evolution, standard type of expansion of the universe would occur, <coughs> then galaxies will form and beings will appear, intelligent beings that look back at the universe and when they look back they will see that they can trace the universe to a state of very low vile uh, curvature. So we have a picture uh, in which this initial ac accounting for this initial state would not be account would not be a different type of rule, but would be accounted dynamical by, by dynamically by this collapse type of theory, in which the strength of the collapse parameter is controlled by uh, the vile curvature. This. Uh, this idea was written in this paper, a not so novel explanation for a very special initial state of the universe. And the reason it's called not so novel is the surprising uh, resemblance that this has with 
more traditional accounts. We have <laughs> Genesis tells us and the, and, the, and the world was in a state of havoc or something like that. It would be in, in Argentinian Spanish, it would be despelote. In, uh, in, 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 in Mexican Spanish, it would be desmadre. <laughs> <coughs> And, and we have the, the Greeks, the Greek theogony, of course, saying in the beginning was chaos. So it's very surprising that we are led to su such story from very different perspective. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs> hey, uh, for, okay, Brian. Oh, thanks so, so much for that talk. Uh, I, well, so I'm just wondering when one goes back to some moment very early before the big or very close to the, to, the, to the Big Bang, when the bowel curvature is very low, there would presumably be very different collapse events happening. And as one gets very, very close, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have as much effective collapse as we're used to in ordinary measurements nowadays. And so my question is, if there wouldn't then be some observational signature that one should detect in the early universe, which would indicate the, well, that measurements aren't playing out the way that we expected them to collapse, you know, isn't happening the way we well. We need, the we need the collapse to account for the measurement problem at late time. So it cannot really go to zero. So there are two possibilities. Either the function that controls how this W, uh, uh, how, how the collapse rate depends on, on the curvature, doesn't really go to zero when W goes to zero. Or, or perhaps the small curvatures that are associated with particles being present in any situation which you have collapse somehow produces a, a, a collapse rate. But we need the collapse rate in the lab to, be, to fall within the regimes that, that, that is uh, you know, allowed by the theory. If not, the theory is, is, is gone. Now, exactly how to extrapolate backwards in time, the only clue we really have is, well, we have these two clues. We know how it behaves in inflation, and apparently you have you need this k dependence that hopefully may come out, may be able, we may be able to account for it in some function of bile curvature. We don't have yet something like that. And we have this other feature that we need if we are going to account for the black hole information thing, that we need it to diverge as w goes up. So these are the only two clues that we really have. <laughs> if somebody can come up with other clues, we would be very grateful because we need to Assemble clues. We, we, ha uh, we have to recognize that at this stage, this is not a finished theory. It's clearly not, we, we don't know what is the collapse operator. We don't know what determines the lambda parameter. So there are many things that d don't work. It's, at this moment, it's a patch, you know, patchwork trying to put things into the theory that will account for this few places where, where we have uh, clues, but, but we don't have a theory, and, and I cannot promise you that a, such a theory really exists. Thanks. Thanks. It's really interesting. I, I'm sorry if I misunderstood, but the idea was to replace the right? No, 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 no. No, this, this particular theory, this particular thing, we have the inflaton, but okay. the inflaton is in the goes very quickly into this bunch Davis vacuum, and then it's homogeneous and isotropic. Okay. And now I need to break the homogeneity to really produce, to actually produce fluctuations. Because having uncertainties is not enough because, you know, uncertainties here are going to be exactly the same as uncertainties here. You keep the virtues of inflation, but you get rid of one of the, the weaknesses, right? Right. I keep, I supplement inflation, I supplement inflation by the spontaneous collapse to now really account for, the, because, I mean, inflation is very successful, but has this conceptual weakness. So we need to address that weakness. Uh, um, just a quick question, and I mean the answer to this may be the theory is in its very early yeah, stages, and who knows. But is there you you were suggesting that there was reason to believe that during these trillions of years, when I'm sorry, when the universe was just Random. sitting there with a very high mile curvature. Um, um, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to start to expand. Uh, well, it's going to be dominated. Is the reason for expanding by, by, uh, by, by this jumping? Do so this. A, do we have a sense of what we would expect that to look like? I have no idea. I see. So we. So we don't. So it's just a hope 
that it would leave us in a, in a place where it's going to look like the Big Bang, or it's going to look like... It's only when that is... Right. It, it's only when that happens by chance yeah, yeah, yeah. that you would hope that you will get yeah, uh, okay. uh, dominated. But good, good, good. Good. Okay. And David, what is, uh, just following up on this supposed weakness with inflation, I mean, if I think about the standard, what I would take to be the standard story here, it's that we have the clear history space forming, um, and we have a homogeneous isotropic superposition of terms, each of which is individually non Homogeneous isotropic. Yeah. Decoherence doesn't alone solve the measurement problem, but plug that into a decoherence based solution to a measurement problem. Yeah. Well, they, I, as I said at the beginning, decoherence doesn't solve the measurement problem. Decoherence. Yeah. Sorry? So plug it into a decoherence based solution like Everett. Okay, how do I choose the basis? How do I uh, choose the basis? Objection to Everett is not an objection within that. I mean, well, sure, you can say Everett doesn't work and Everett Yeah, I, I, I think Everett doesn't work. But then it seems unreasonable yes. to say that that's, that's another... Well, if the, if the full nice. state, if, if all there is is the state, and the state is homogeneous and isotropic, of course I can now write any state in terms of any basis that you want, and if you want, I, by choosing the appropriate basis, I could tell you all sorts of uh, different stories. The question is, how do you account for the fact that our universe emerged from a state that is supposed to be completely homogeneous and isotropic in all that there is, and, and you assume that all that there is, is the state. If you assume that there is something beyond the, beyond the state, like Bohmian, uh, Bohmian view, then you have a state and you have the distribution of positions or something like that, then your state can be homogeneous and isotropic and the full physical situation may not. But if your full physical situation is homogeneous and isotropic, you, of course, can project the state in any basis that you choose and predict whatever you want. Right, but this is just a comment on the literature, really. I mean, I think the, the way you presented it gave the impression that there's a non sequitur in the reasoning of people doing standard inflation. I guess what I'm saying is what people in standard inflation are doing is the coherence theory, and, and they're appealing to Everett or Everett-type solutions to the measurement problem. Right, but... And so it's totally easy to say those solutions to the measurement problem don't work, but then that's the locus of criticism of people in the coherence, in, in terms of their own preferred way of thinking about quantum mechanics, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. Yeah, you cannot select the basis. That's no, one thing. I don't think you're. I remember a conversation between yeah. the two of us years ago when you presented this picture mm -hmm. uh -huh. that is the cosmological picture. And I said, and he presented it in terms of GRW or something like yeah. that. And I said, look, you don't need GRW. All, any solution. Any genuine solution to the measurement problem. That's we'll true. Yeah, I agree. And, and I agree. This is what David. Yeah. Saying. Okay. This so it, that's about whether okay. Everett is a solution. Yeah. Problem. Okay. So I don't think that Everett is a solution to yeah, the yeah, measurement yeah. problem. So, so that's yes. Just saying that there's a spontaneous, mysterious collapse mechanism that enters in as no better explanation for why. No. Yes. It's a problem. much better explanation. It's a much better no, explanation it's because it. <laughs> yeah. Because it's very definite rules that you can test that you can uh, be forced to face problems that you normally don't even tr face when you uh, take an Everett view. When you take an Everett view, for instance, and, con and consider the question energy conservation that was asked here, people take the view, OK, if I consider the full wave function, then the energy momentum tensor is conserved. And then you don't have to deal with this problem of energy momentum conservation because the, you don't realize that what you are, have just said is that what is realized and what we experience is one of the branches. And th only then, when you select that there is one of the branches, you will see that in that branch, the energy momentum tensor is not conserved. And it's only then that you will be forced to face the hard problem. If you have, if you have a scheme that is very vague, that is not precise, that is not clear, that is not definite, you will be confused thinking that there are no problems where there are problems. So perhaps here's the conciliatory thing to say. Um, your, or maybe it's a little we'll see. What you said was that um, it's, it, what you're advocating is pursuing um, a, a exploration of these quantum cosmology points of view approaches from the point of view of a definite interpretation of quantum yeah. mechanics. I guess what I'm saying is that I think mainstream cosmology is doing the same thing. It's just its preferred interpretation of quantum mechanics is deeping into that. Yeah, and, I, and that's why I no, said... No, 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 no
I didn't think no. really anyone else. Yeah. We don't really talk about it as much. We can clearly track these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Garrick has another question. Thanks for the yeah. talk, man. It's very interesting. <laughs> Um, at some point, you make a point of emphasizing that you had an assumption about initial conditions that has the status of a law. And I'm wondering, what, was, what role is played by insisting that this assumption you're making is a law? What, what does that get you? Well, in my view, it gives you a unified picture of various many questions, right? One of the questions that we said is, how do I account for this issue in cosmology that we don't seem to agree here? <laughs> uh, one of the other questions is, what, how do we account for black hole information uh, problem, right? If you believe that quantum gravity cures the but thing. Mathematic, uh, mathematically, if it's just uh, a certain assumption that you write down, I, I just don't see that calling it a law changes what you can derive from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a certain assumption that you write down. I mean, Sorry, I'm not understanding what you're... Well, Okay, I think that you stress that the, this uh, very, very peculiar initial condition um, is a different kind of law because in uh, the whole approach, you no longer need that assumption. So I think it, I, I'm just trying to read what you were saying. You say, okay, the standard uh, way to do it, you have to have this uh, assumption, which is a weird kind of law. It has to do with initial conditions and not with dynamics. And that, that might be considered um, problematic for some. In this approach, you don't need to do that. Because you no longer need the, this initial condition uh, arises uh, through dynamics. So you no longer need this weird law. Um, okay. No, but I, 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 sorry, I couldn't understand what you, yeah. So yeah, our, our, they, the issue with the, the, with the other thing is not that it's wrong in itself, or is, but it's that it's an unusual kind of law. And here we have a scheme which is a normal type of law that would... Hey, Craig. Um, why do you like vile curvature so much? Uh, so you have uh, yeah, uh, no, no incoming source free gravitational radiation. The gravitational radiation is so, 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 so. So, 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 so weak. No, but look, but in this, in this story, in this story, in this story, oh, sorry. Okay, here, 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 here is the story. Look, look, look at this picture. I need to erase, I need to erase, sorry, perhaps it's not big enough. I need to erase, here, the entanglement between the system here and the system here is in a sense, represents the information I need to erase. And while in this region, in this part of, of, of uh, uh, the black hole interior, there is a lot of matter, and therefore, there is Ricci curvature and scalar curvature, in this part, you are not going to get any, any type of curvature except wild curvature. So if I want my collapse rate to be important in this region, and the information that is here to be erased, I need to have a big rate here for collapse. If I make it dependent on scalar curvature, I will not. Okay. But I, I thought that the, maybe it's just upset with the fact that see, but I thought at the end you were saying you were getting, you know, like thermodynamics and all of this out of that. Ah, well, so I'm connecting with, with uh, uh, Roger Penrose's idea that says, the difference between the you know the difference between the initial what sub, what seems to be the initial state of our universe ha, and and what you could imagine as a generic not specially chosen state of initial state of the universe is the vile curvature because scalar curvature and Ricci curvature they all diverge here as well as here but what is very different in this picture and this picture is vile curvature. Here you have very large curvature, and here you have zero vile curvature. That I agree with, but I'm, that I could imagine the thermodynamic arrow being either way in both of those pictures. Well, he would, he would say the fact that this vile curvature is very is small there is related to the fact that we don't have something like white holes or anything like that, that in his view, are representative of, you know, 
high entropy that we do find in, late, in the late universe contained in the very many large black holes that will characterize the you know, late time situations of the universe. So I'm taking that from, from, from Penrose. That Right. I mean, even Penrose would say that you, you wouldn't want to simply couple entropy to the vial curvature because of the issue of getting near the black hole. No, I, I think his view. I think his view. His 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 view. If I understand the, the view, is that vial curvature somehow encodes entropy that is really in the quantum gravity degrees of freedom. It encodes in the in the semi-classical or the classical characterization of gravitation, what is truly ordinary, if you want, entropy right. in the quantum gravity regime. Exactly. So, so... Okay, many thanks, David. Daniel. David is here. <laughs>